And I'd uh, first of all like to uh, thank uh, all of our uh, MEC folks for, for the support of this, uh, of this uh, wonderful lunch and also uh, the special uh, privilege that we have uh, for this keynote luncheon uh, with somebody who I know you're going to find very, very interesting. Um, as uh, I've uh, introduced myself before, I'm Sean Cassidy, Captain Sean Cassidy. I'm the first uh, Vice President of the Airline Pilots Association and also our National uh, Safety Coordinator. So when the FAA Modernization uh, Reform Act of 2012 was passed uh, last year, as many of you know, amongst the uh, list of legislatively directed items that were included in that bill, uh, one of the th ones which uh, grabbed a lot of our attention was a direction to the FAA to basically take point and set an integration standard by September 30th of uh, 2015 for the safe uh, integration of unmanned aircraft systems, which we like to call remotely piloted aircraft, uh, into the U.S. national airspace system. So for obvious reasons, the whole uh, issue of RPAs has been a very, very high focus item, uh, and there have plenty of, been plenty of hearings, uh, plenty of meetings, and, and I did uh, take note of the fact that after Congressman Lobiondo spoke to us uh, this morning, I don't know if you picked up on it, but uh, he was going to go uh, right afterwards to a meeting with the Aviation Subcommittee of the Transportation and Infrastructure uh, Committee, and one of the items that he was going to be talking about was uh, UAS. So as Congress continues its oversight of UAS and advances the issue, ALPA continues to press for one level of safety uh, with regard to their operation, and simply put, what that really means is that a world inclusive of UAS operations sharing our airspace should be every bit as safe as a world exclusive of it right now or when they have segregated ops or operations by special agreement. And in fact, I'm also pleased to, to uh, let everybody here know that uh, we have recruited two uh, talented uh, pilots who have the new, unique perspective of not only being uh, commercial airline pilots but also have frontline operational experience operating these things uh, both in the military and uh, they're joining the air safety organization, one from FedEx and one from Delta. So clearly, this is a top safety and strategic uh, focus for our association, and that's why we're so very pleased to have Mr. Jim Williams here today to share some of his insights as the person at the FAA really tasked with, uh, with that mandate that Congress delivered. Jim is the manager of the FAA's newly established Unmanned Aircraft Systems Integration Office, and in that capacity, he leads the agency's efforts to safely and efficiently integrate remotely piloted aircraft into the national airspace system. And I'm sure, again, you're going to be very interested to hear what he has to say this afternoon. Jim has an extensive experience for this kind of undertaking. Before uh, he got assigned the UAS uh, docket, he was the head of the engineering services uh, with the FA uh, specific to the next-gen integration uh, for six years and was tasked with uh, some of the technical aspects of, of creating the next-gen implementation, a lot of which has also been uh, uh, kind of uh, described and mandated by uh, legislative action. During his long tenure with the FAA, he's also led the implementation of safety management system and the technical operations service unit and headed up the team that developed and installed all the air, the ground communication services for the FAA. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Williams. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, when I took this job, one of my favorite things to do is public speaking. And uh, I had no idea when I took it that that was going to be sort of a constant demand to, uh, to do that. But it's, it's been great. I've been having a lot of fun. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Alpa inviting me here today and feeding me a, a wonderful lunch. Uh, one of my old bosses, uh, Charlie Keegan, used to say, I will work for food. So uh, I think that's a great philosophy. Uh, so as you've heard, the FAA has st stood up a new office. It's been almost a year. I mean, it's been over a year now since I started this job. The stand-up process is complicated, and I won't bore you with the details. But finally up and running, fully recognized by the FAA, and, and suffering the effects of, of uh, sequestration with everybody else. So. Uh, when I came on board, I wanted to make sure that uh, I was really representing the, the entirety of the FAA. Previously, the situation had been there was an organization in flight standards uh, that consisted of flight standards and aircraft certification folks, and there was an organization in the air traffic. And they sort of worked in their swim lanes, and their, their 
was coordination, but it wasn't tight coordination. And so when I came on board, my mission was to bring that together and to make sure that we were also taking into consideration the other aspects of the FAA, like international and airports, uh, as well as security, et cetera. So, you know, I felt like, I, based on my experience, I mean, if you look at my resume, it looks like I can't hold a job because I've been in so many different roles in the FAA. But the end result of that has been that I sort of have a good big picture of what we do. So it's really helped me in bringing the FAA together. And, and we call it the integration office because we're responsible for integrating UAS and the NAS, but we're also responsible for integrating all aspects of the FAA's effort to integrate UAS and the NAS. Sorry to be shuffling papers here. So, am I ahead? So when I took, on, took this job on, I wanted to make sure that everybody understood that the, you know, the role of the office was uh, all-encompassing. So, so what does that really look like? Well, it's the safe, efficient, and timely integration of UAS and NAS. Safe because it has to be. That's the FAA's number one goal. That's always going to be in the forefront of what we're doing. But it also has to be efficient. I mean, a lot of you out there are flying in the system every day. You put up with all kinds of delays. The next-gen program is trying to help answer those questions. And it's absolutely imperative that the integration of UAS, you know, not get in the way of that improved say, uh, efficiency and reliability of the NAS. So safe and efficient. But it also has to be timely. Now, why timely? Well, you know, as the... I keep hitting double on this thing, sorry. So timely, because this is a huge growth potential for the US and the world in aviation. I mean, it really is the most important change to aviation to come along since the jet engine. And it's about as disruptive to the, you know, the status quo as the jet engine was. But this report just came out from our good friends at AUVSI. $82 billion of activity, over 100,000 jobs created, and a lot of those jobs will be for the pilots to fly the aircraft. There's a lot of possible uses. In Japan, they recently crossed over to where more acres are crop dusted by unmanned aircraft than manned aircraft. And this is, you know, this is startling. Now, one of the enabling factors for that in Japan is that agricultural spraying efforts are regulated by the agriculture department not their civil aviation authority. So uh, they have to truck them to the field. They can't fly them from point A to point B. But nonetheless, it is a major business and there's a lot of interest in folks who are manufacturing this equipment to start doing it here in the US. Okay, so what? Everybody says, well, why, you know, yeah, it's a big deal, but what are you gonna do to make sure that this is all safe, FAA? I mean, after all, these things can't see and avoid other aircraft. Well, that's one of several areas that we have to deal with when it comes to safe integration of, of UAS into the NAS. There are many critical issues. One of them, and probably the one that's the most well known, is the, the issue of seeing and avoiding. So where does that come from? God, I did it again. Where does that come from? For those of you who are pilots, you should be well aware of this. This is Part 91, the operating rules for everybody. This rule applies to all aircraft, both uh, civil and public or government aircraft. And it essentially says you gotta maintain your vigilance and not run into anybody. Well, an unmanned aircraft can't really comply with this. Uh, previous interpretations of the many rules that use the word C have uh, resulted in a definition from the FAA that says, well, C means the eyeballs of the pilot. You can wear glasses, but you, you, know, you can't use a camera. You can't use binoculars. So. The most latest example of this is those of you who, uh, anybody here from Alaska Airlines, who's you know, starting to fly uh, enhanced vision systems, those technically don't, com uh, don't comply with uh, 91-175, which says you have to be able to see the airport environment at the decision height. Because with the unaided eye, you couldn't. But looking through the glass, you could. So we had to change the rules. Same thing applies here. Looking through that soda straw of a camera, you can't really see and avoid other aircraft. So this is a big challenge. 
So what are we doing about it? Well, we've first off, there's a, uh, not ready for that yet. First off, we have an arc. And um, Mark Green, who's here, Mark, raise your hand. There's Mark. Mark's one of my uh, members of the UAS ARC. And the UAS ARC is currently looking at 91113 to see, okay, well, how can we change this the same way we changed 91175 to allow an electronic means to comply with this rule? So that electronic means, of course, we have to have a standard. We have a standard for enhanced vision systems. We're going to have to have a standard for the see and avoid avionics. That's being developed through RTCA, as most of our uh, certification standards are. Uh, they're kicking off next week the effort to write that standard. We're estimating completion of that standard by 2016. And that's mostly to support military operations because as you, this rule applies to all persons. So the military has to comply as well. We want one standard for all see and avoid electronic systems. Another issue that was on my slide of issues is the radio control link. So one of the biggest, most noticeable, obvious differences from an unmanned aircraft to a manned aircraft is pilots on the ground. And you know, I don't think there's any manned aircraft out there today that have a, a radio frequency connection between the pilot and the control surfaces. I think we're pretty much solid on either electrical or mechanical there. So this is really unique. This is one of the biggest differences that we have to deal with. Because as right now, if an unmanned aircraft loses its link, between the pilot and the aircraft, not only can the pilot no longer tell the aircraft what to do, they can't talk to air traffic control either. Because the radio that they're using to talk to, the air traffic controller is on the airplane. And the connection is lost there too. So pretty big deal, much bigger deal than just losing comms. At least you can still aviate. So we require the unmanned aircraft to be able to continue to aviate on their own. And that they have you know, the capability to automatically continue to fly. Now, those automatic commands are built into the aircraft, they're pre-programmed, we know what they're going to be. But part of the next-gen program is going to actually allow those lost link procedures, we call them, to be loaded into the controller's workstation so that they'll know what it's going to do too. Another key change to uh, the system for next-gen is we're putting out a new air ground voice, command, voice control system that allows the controllers to talk to the pilots. Well, this new system is going to be you know, built on modern telecommunications technology where it's really more of a router type system. So why would the pilot have to talk through the vehicle when they're on the ground, controllers on the ground, let's just connect them up and provide them that, um, that same party line information that the pilot and controller currently enjoy today. Another requirement in next gen. So we're tackling this systemic uh, effort and one thing to really note on this slide, you see the three components of the unmanned aircraft system, and that's the, the air vehicle itself, the command and control link between the air vehicle and the ground station. And well, the fourth piece isn't really shown on here, and that's the pilot. We don't allow autonomous operations in the NAS, and the ICAO definition of autonomous is when the vehicle has no ability for uh, changing its flight once it's been launched. So that's not allowed. It's a, a, a not allowed in the ICAO guidance as well. It's an international standard. Unmanned aircraft systems require a pilot who can change the trajectory of that aircraft as part of their interaction with air traffic control. So they can, you know, back to what Sean said, they can interact with the system the same way that, that manned aircraft do, and that's our ultimate goal. So who's operating aircraft? Well, for the time being, most of the aircraft are being operated by the US government. Uh, a large portion are military, of course, but they're not, it's not exclusively military at all. Most of the federal departments who have manned aircraft, not all, but most, are beginning to get into the unmanned aircraft business just because of the, the lower cost and uh, different capabilities that you can achieve with it. NASA is in the business both of using unmanned aircraft for their science missions to observe things like volcanoes and uh, faults, et cetera, as part of their earth sciences, but their, their aero 
portion of their research is supporting us in the integration of UAS and the NAS with a $150 million program called Integration of UAS and the NAS, and that we're working very closely together with them. So they're both an operator and a, a, a researcher in the, the technology. And then the biggest growth area is probably uh, law, law enforcement. There are a huge amount of uh, capabilities in law enforcement for operating unmanned aircraft. I, I have a picture up here of the Customs and Borders aircraft because how many of you knew that Customs and Border is flying their eight airplanes 24 hours a day, seven days a week along both the northern and southern border in Class A airspace? Some of you have probably shared the airspace with one of these aircraft and been in the same sector with them and, and they're being controlled by our uh, in route air traffic controllers every day and uh, they're very good citizens of the, of the NAS. They operate in the, the lower portions of the Class A and we work very closely with them to support their missions. Law enforcement. We created um, about a year ago, we came to an agreement with the National Institutes of Justice on a approach that we call the common strategy that allows small unmanned aircraft, 25 pounds or less, pretty small, to be used by law enforcement. The approach is they come in, they say, hey, we want to use one. We set up a training area for them, very small. They have to develop their procedures, have to, you know, come up to speed and become, you know, uh, aviation professionals and then we approve them to operate in their whole jurisdiction which can be quite challenging. The bottom two pictures on this slide are of the Arlington, Texas Police Department. Anybody know what's in sort of a significant aviation facility in Arlington County, Texas? Dallas Fort Worth Airport, yes. It is a major deal for us to figure out how to authorize them to operate their aircraft safely in the vicinity of Dallas-Fort Worth. A lot of coordination, a lot of restrictions, uh, essentially to keep them out of the way of that uh, major hub. But we figured out a way to do it, and they are now operating. Law enforcement doesn't want to use unmanned aircraft for what you think, for surveilling people. Most of these aircraft can only fly for 20, 30 minutes, an hour at the most. Some of the biggest uses they have for them is, is in a you know, SWAT situation to make sure that the their police aren't going to get ambushed. Or what's really fascinating to me is they use them for accident recreation. I mean, how, how many of you have heard on the local news about, oh, they're closing the streets, they've got to go do this accident recreation, the roads are closed down for hours. They can roll up with one of these little guys, launch it, fly a grid pattern over the accident while it's still being cleaned up, have all their information, and off they go. So none of us are waiting for a big traffic jam to be cleared. Uh, not only that, but there's commercially available software that takes that, that grid pattern from the high definition camera and turns it into a three dimensional uh, viewable, you know, through a computer image of what had happened and where everything was. And, e and there's even software that can take that image and do a 3D printer and print out a 3D rendering of the, of the situation. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. It's a great tool for law enforcement and we're doing everything we can to safely allow them to access to this technology. So we talked a lot about um, the government operations. Well, what about commercial operations? You know, when, when are the people going to start you know, legitimately being able to make money on this? One of the taskers that we got from Congress, and by the way, there were six pages of the Reauthorization Act, six pages, a whole subpart of the reauthorization dedicated to telling the FAA what we needed to do to integrate UAS and the NAS. So uh, I can't go through all six pages of you. I did that for my staff one day to lay it all out for them. It took me four hours. So I'm going to hit on one of them because it, it's sort of leading us into the commercial operations, and that's the uh, Arctic provisions. You know, when I was in probably grade school and was learning geography the first time, Arctic, the word Arctic meant above the Arctic Circle, right? Well, not in the FAA Reauthorization Act. The FAA Reauthorization Act redefines Arctic to mean this area uh, that we have to open up for commercial uh, use 24-7, beyond line of sight, 2,000 feet and below, so fairly high, uh, for 
commercial use of unmanned small, and small is defined as 55 pounds or less. So the area that is now defined as the Arctic is the area in pink on this slide. The circle that's flashing on and off is showing you where uh, the oil leases are that the oil companies have for doing oil exploration. Turns out that offshore in relatively uh, you know, low depths, like 100, in the relatively high depths, and around 150 feet, as opposed to the 1,000 feet they're doing down in the Gulf, there's oil under the, under the ground out there. So the oil companies, there's four of them that have leases to explore in that area. And they're the driver behind this part of the legislation. They want to use unmanned aircraft, because currently they're flying uh, twin otters out of, I'm not sure exactly which portion of the, anybody in here ever flown in Alaska? Surely there's somebody who's flown in Alaska. There we go, there we go. So we got some people who flew in Alaska, so they really understand how difficult as a mission it is to fly a twin otter out there to where the ice cap is, and look for chunks of ice that are coming off the ice cap that are floating towards those, you know, those oil platforms that could potentially crunch into them and cause an oil spill. Well, that's obviously not something the oil companies want to happen, so they need to have, so they got these twin otters out there, you know, flying out looking for, uh, you know, icebergs and then flying back. Obviously, they'd like to have something that was a little more persistent out there to look and that could give them, you know, more warning so they could actually follow the, the ice flows to see if they really are going to hit them or not. Because it costs them a small fortune to pick up stakes and move when the icebergs come. Also, you know, from the government standpoint, one of the provisions that allowed them to drill up there was that they have to show that they're not interfering with the migratory patterns of the whales. Now, anybody who's ever flown in or a uh, twin otter knows they're not really the most quiet aircraft ever built. And so when they fly low enough to actually start counting the whales, the whales look up and go, well, that's kind of irritating, and they start swimming the other way. So the, various, the very reason you're trying to look at the whales, you're actually you know, defeating the purpose. Small unmanned aircraft can uh, fly over those whales. They pay no attention, and they can, they can watch them. So this summer, in order to try to accomplish this Herculean task that Congress has set for us, you know, I initiated the demonstration. I said, OK, well, let's walk through this path. Let's see exactly what it's going to take us to do this. We'll do it in a very small spot with one aircraft. We'll figure out all of the hurdles we're going to have to go through. And so over the past year, we've been working toward doing that. And I signed a, a cooperative agreement with ConocoPhillips, where they're going to take one of their exploratory ships. They're going to put a Scan Eagle on it. And the Scan Eagle will receive an actual commercial certification. See, I'm actually getting back to the point that I started with. We're actually going to have a commercial certification of this aircraft in the restricted category to allow them to legally operate commercially in, in that portion of the ocean. Now, the Scan Eagle is the perfect aircraft for this because it was designed for the Navy to operate off of ships. It can uh, fly for up to 20 hours without landing. It only weighs about 50 pounds, pretty good size aircraft. It's launched from a catapult, and it's recovered. See that little circle there? That's the Scan Eagle coming to, quote, land on the ship. This isn't the actual ConocoPhillips ship. This is a demo that was done with the Coast Guard a couple of years ago. But there's a, a cable hung from the, that tall pole in the middle of the ship there. And the Scan Eagle hangs that cable with one of its wings, spins around, and then they lower it to the deck. So if you've never seen it, it's pretty interesting. You can just look it up on YouTube, Scan Eagle landing. You look at, search for that on YouTube, and you can see the video of it, of it landing. Looks more like a cold, controlled crash to me, but it works. It's designed for it and it works. So we're pretty excited about that. We've walked down a whole, you know, overcome a whole bunch of obstacles about figuring out how to, how to um, establish some airspace out there and essentially segregate these operations from manned aircraft, how to coordinate manned aircraft operations that want to go into that segregated airspace. So it's been, it's been quite a challenge. A lot of folks, both inside the FAA and out, have contributed to this. We've stayed in touch with our friends in AOPA explaining to them what it's all about, and making sure that they're, you know, they're okay with this approach. So I would like to close with a little discussion about you know, another portion of the reauthorization bill on model aircraft. So take a look at this picture. Note the man standing next to the tail and the fact that the tail of this aircraft is almost as tall as him. Those 
engines on that B-52 model are actual turbojet, baby, little baby turbojet engines, eight of them. This is a model aircraft. Congress has forbidden the FAA from making any rules governing model aircraft other than the ones we have. But they also say, hey, but now the safety rules that you have in place, you can, you can enforce. So fortunately for us, most of the people who fly model aircraft are very responsible. They fly out of places that are set up for the purpose, that are monitored with safety, you know, they have safety monitoring, et cetera, and they really are safe. I mean, there's been no, you know, reported accidents that we've been able to find of a model aircraft versus a, a GA aircraft or any other kind. So we really not, I mean, we, you know, we kind of agree with Congress that we really don't need to be regulating the model aircraft folks. However, however, there are a lot of, oops, don't want to give it there yet. There are a lot of uh, um, operators out there who are um, not necessarily following this, the, the rules, misinterpreting this language and, and, and uh, believing that they are uh, exempt from FAA regulations. One thing I forgot to mention before I left the commercial ops is this next picture. This is a picture of a prototype for an aircraft that is attempting to go through actual type certification to get a, a, a standard airworthiness certificate uh, to fly what we call a high altitude long endurance mission, a communication, basically be a communications platform that would fly over a city. They just started last August and I think it, those of you who understand aircraft certification know that Boeing spent 20 years certifying the 787. It takes a while to go through the process. They just got started. There's a long way to go. And, and Boeing didn't have nearly as many special conditions that, than the uh, Aero Environment is going to have. But it is a significant event that there is an aircraft making its way through the certification process. And uh, you know, we'll keep you up to date on how that goes over the years as we're moving through that. Now, back to the model aircraft guys. So the model aircraft guys, um, most of them are good, good citizens, but with the advent of readily available unmanned aircraft systems with sophisticated autopilots and a technology called first person perspective view. Essentially you install a camera in the nose of the model aircraft and you put on a set of virtual reality goggles that essentially take that transmitted signal from the camera and show it to you in front of your eyes. So now it looks like you're actually in the aircraft and you can fly it. Pretty cool and it allows you to go like if you don't have that, you have to watch your airplane to know what maneuvers to make. So it tends to stay pretty close to you. Once you have first person perspective, now you're really only limited by the range of your radio. And that gives us pause because if you can't see the aircraft and you can't see general aviation aircraft, it, it might be going in conflict to, And that really concerns us. So much to the point where this individual was hired to fly and do a promotional video for the uh, University of Virginia's Medical Center, which you see here in the picture on the left. And on the right, you see a blow up of the fact that there is a heliport on top of that uh, medical center, which means there is active aircraft, manned aircraft flying in and out of there. Well, this individual was flying his unmanned aircraft around the campus of the University of Virginia, down to like 10 feet, you know, people having to move out of the way, flying it in close proximity to this heliport, totally without any sort of authorization from the FAA whatsoever. Um, and he was nice enough to post that video on YouTube for us. <laughs> so now we can make the case pretty easily that, hey, you know, when that person jumped out of the way of that aircraft as you went under that pedestrian bridge, probably was not a safe operation. So we went through the entire process, find the guy 10 grand, and, uh, you know, but, but the idea is that we really are trying to get on top of this and we really want, uh, how many of you heard about the report at JFK of, uh, made the news about a, a unmanned aircraft of some sort seen off the approach of JFK? I get a lot more of those that don't make the news and it's really becoming a concern to me and so I'm, I'm ending my pitch today to you, all of you who are pilots, if you see something, say something. Tell the FAA, tell the air traffic control tower if you don't want to bother air traffic, send an email to uh, flight standards, etc. We will investigate every one of those and if we can figure out who did it, we'll talk to them and explain to them just how foolish they're being because it, it is becoming a more and more frequent con 
So I wanted to end, you know, this is a safety conference, unmanned aircraft safety here and now today. We need your help in identifying these individuals to uh, try to get them to behave a little bit. So in conclusion, safe, efficient, timely integration of UAS and the NAS, that's what we're all about. And just as a little bit of comic relief, I wanted to show you what could be the future of aviation. See if this plays. We fly to your house, it makes a noise, you pick it up, and that's that. Um, but behind the scenes, like controlling it, setting it up, it's a lot harder than it looks. This is actual video from a local television station in Philadelphia that uh, you know we saw about through the, the normal press process. Step towards the future. They have never seen anything like this, and um, hopefully they'll get used to it because that's what we plan on doing. Okay. Well, in reality, when we sent some inspectors to talk to this individual, uh, he, he admitted that it was really just a publicity stunt, and he doesn't plan on actually delivering the dry cleaning with his little unmanned aircraft. And you know, we said, look, you know, it's probably not a good idea to be flying this thing down busy city streets. It's, and he got the message. And you know, and I, I want to point that out because. You know, we're not in this to, to, to be enforcers, be the police, and put out fines. We really are in this to try to make sure people are safe. 99% of the population out there is really just doesn't understand that they're doing something that isn't, isn't safe. And so we talk to them and they stop. So, you know, that's, that's the end of my pitch today. Hopefully I uh, entertained you a little bit, gave you a little bit of information. And I don't know what our time limit is here and whether we have, have time for questions. About 15 minutes for questions. Sure. Anybody have questions? Just, just stand up and please identify yourself so I know. I'm Tim Pollock, uh, FedEx uh, UAS Center. Quick, uh, let's talk about how you achieve certificate certification as a pilot. Well, I, you know, maybe I'm simple minded, but I, I think there really there shouldn't be that much difference. I mean, we've got. We have pilot, basic pilot training, pilot skills, and then you have the specific training required for the aircraft. You know, these are aircraft, these are pilots, they, have, they fly out of cockpits. You know, we, we need to be approaching it a similar way. Now, this, this specialized training for the aircraft, granted, it's gonna be completely different, but it's also completely different between a Cessna 152 and a 380. So, you know, I, I, I see us having to do, deal with some of the differences, like lost link, et cetera, but you know the difference between aircraft are pretty significant as well. So, you know I don't see that one as a as a a technological hurdle. I think we have some you know differences in human factors that we're going to have to get over, just like we have with any new technology that's come along. But uh, you know I see them being very similar to the way we've dealt with all kinds of new technologies as they've come along. Oh, here first, then, then over there. Currently, we say no. We say because of the, the, just the reality of, okay, if you're operating in, a, in an air traffic environment and you have two air traffic controllers telling you to do two things at once, that's just not very practical. Um, you know, I, I, I never say never because, you know, there are a lot of people said that, you know, an airplane would never be able to land itself. Now we have autolands that are fairly routine. And during my career in aviation, which is, you know, longer than I like to admit, that you know, we went from sort of it was a dream to do an auto land. You know that maybe someday something magical will happen. Whereas to now it's, you know, it's it's fairly standard practice for the airplane to come in and land itself. So won't say never. Currently we don't allow it. One aircraft, one pilot. That's the rule. There we go. Uh, so the yeah the question 
is, well, what happens if an aircraft has a complete power loss in flight? You know, what are the provisions for it to, to be a glider? And, and, you know, I go back to same kind of issues as with, uh, you know, manned aircraft. I mean, if you're in an F-16, you get a complete power loss, time to punch out because it's a rock. On the other hand, there's a lot of GA aircraft that have been successfully, you know, landed like a glider in an emergency situation. Same thing applies. If on, on the smalls, for example, with the police, we make them clear the area out from underneath, based essentially based on the assumption that, hey, that thing could run out of power and fall, and you want to make sure that it's not going to fall and hit somebody. So, you know, there are, there are all kinds of different provisions made for that. Uh, I think the real difference is in the smalls because, you know, a manned aircraft, I mean, Customs and Border, when they first started flying, they actually had a, a power loss failure, you know, and their vehicle did, it did crash. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's not that different than manned aviation when you get down to it. Well, on the, the bigger aircraft, like the Predator, they actually, when they, one of the displays they have up at all times is a sectional, with their aircraft position being plotted on that sectional. So, in, you know, in some ways, they actually have some advantages over, over manned aircraft to kind of know exactly where they are at all times relative to the, you know, the aviation infrastructure. But yes, good point. One of those things we have to consider that when you're, when you're trying to aviate through a straw, it's not, a, not that easy. Yeah, I, I got a question that a lot of people seem to be asking me, and, and uh, it, it basically with the integration timeline with the September 2015 uh, legislatively directed kind of uh, cutoff, what do you think the world's going to look like the day after, you know, October 1st, 2015? What kind of integration, what kind of segue are we going to see? So if you, I need to make sure I always have this slide in my deck. If you look at the actual words in the legislation, it says that the FAA has to prepare a plan to explain essentially how we're going to integrate by 2015, safely integrate. So to me that means, hey FAA, do everything you can to move the ball forward, but give us a specific you know, steps that you're gonna do between now and 2015. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with the folks who wrote that legislation uh, one thing to note was that it was written four and a half years earlier and it never got updated during the four and a half years of the development of the legislation. Uh, so they actually had, had visioned something much further in the future. Second, I mean, the, their real intent was, come on FAA, we want you to have a plan. It needs to have specific milestones in the plan. We want you to report on how, you know, how you're doing against those milestones and we're going to hold you accountable for that. So that's what they really want. So. What are we going to have done by then? The sm we're targeting the small uh, unmanned aircraft rule, which is essentially a, it's, it's more of a deregulation than it is a regulation for the, the small ones under 55 pounds flown within line of sight of the pilot, and that's visual line of sight, not radio line of sight. Um, they're going to be able to operate uh, in you know, limited areas essentially segregating. Below 400 feet is kind of a segregation. Manned aircraft aren't supposed to be below that, but they'll be accomplishing the see and avoid by the pilot seeing the aircraft, being able to see the environment, making sure that, you know, that a HEMS helicopter or something isn't, isn't entering the area they're operating. And it's pretty easy for them to just drop down and get out of the way. So that is a significant form of integration because what we've seen, and AUVSI would agree with me, a huge portion of the pent-up demand for UAS commercial operations is in that category, in that small UAS. Secondly, we're going to have the six test ranges up and running. That's going to be the biggest move toward integration. And to explain a little bit more, these test ranges are not going to be in restricted airspace. These are going to be places where organizations have developed a way of maintaining safe separation or segregation, you know, depending to essentially integrate in these six test, site, test, six test sites. So we're going through extensive analysis on you know, how they're planning to comply with that integration rule. The example for this is New Mexico State already has a range set up down in New Mexico next door to the White Sands Missile Range, which anybody who's been down there, you know there's a whole lot of nothing in that part of New Mexico. 
and they've got a range set up there which they manage on their own. So there's, there's that level of integration already going on. So essentially, we're just gonna lay out these steps towards safe integration in that plan, and that's going to be what safe integration means by 2015. Well, one more question, and then we're gonna make it kind of quick, because I wanna keep us on timeline, and I know we still have reserves, and we wanna get into that. Uh, quick question, are there restrictions for the small UAVs operating in icy conditions, and are the pilots of the UAVs trained in winter operations? So, Small UASs are currently uh, limited to day VFR. You know, that's our plan, is it's day VFR operations. So if it's, you know, if it's IFR, they shouldn't be flying anyway, so icing isn't, isn't an issue. The question on icing for the military aircraft and customs and border is a good one, and they are not equipped for flight into known icing, so therefore they have a restriction that says, you know, you stay out of weather. You, so, but it, again, we're applying the same you know, icing rules to them as we would apply to a manned aircraft. If you're not certified for flight into known icing, you don't go there. And the, you know, so uh, the, the, if you really start thinking about the differences between manned and unmanned as strictly dealing with the fact that they can't see and avoid and we have to deal with the fact that the pilot connection to the controls is this radio link, those are the areas where there are differences and we're stressing with our rules and policies, et cetera. When it comes to the basic you know, aviation rules, we're trying to apply them just like manned aircraft because they're gonna have to coexist in the system with everybody else. And, and you know, the fewer differences, the better from an integration standpoint. Thank you, enjoy it. So again, I I, I think, uh, you know, I can't thank you enough for, for coming and joining us, and I think, uh, you know, this is another example of, of the level of engagement that we have and, and uh, the focus on uh, really relevant topics, because I know UAS is one of those uh, technologies, one of, one of those uh, evolutions of aviation, which is clearly going to be a massively game-changing conce concept right now and in the future. Um, that concludes our luncheon. Uh, I believe that we have some desserts outside. Uh, please be uh, sure to thank uh, our exhibitors as well, and we'll see you back in the forum. Thank you so much.